So first things first, Katie, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm, uh, I've just finished two and a half weeks of rehearsing with my band. Mm. And we, uh, we're meant to have a big tour starting in September to, for the you know, album that's coming out. But some of the shows are cancelled. Some yeah. of the shows might go ahead. So it's, it's interesting times. What has that process been to go from, well, all these years making this record and now translating it to how it will sound live? What, what have the past couple of weeks been, been like? It's, um, it's always a strange feeling because you, first of all, there is so much excitement to have new songs. Sure. And what's amazing is like, we're playing all 10 new songs. Um, and that doesn't always happen. Like you don't always, you kind of tend to pick the singles from the new album, but there just wasn't a single song from the new record that I wanted to leave out. Okay. Um, and then there is the feeling of you want to like play them exactly as you recorded them, but that's impossible. And so you kind of have to like develop the songs in a different way. And you have to develop them with the band, you know, because the live band is a little bit different to the studio band. Okay. And so you kind of have to grow it with, you know, with the feelings now, you know. So I'm a real believer that um, nothing kind of stays the same, you know, and as time moves on, we, we grow and things influence us constantly and what gets said and what we experience. So these songs are now post the pandemic. And um, with with new people, you know, with new feelings and new emotions, and uh, and it was about working all of that out over the last two weeks. Right, and that's an interesting thought I think uh, about songwriting in general, where uh, you are obviously not the same person you were maybe six months, maybe a year ago when you wrote these songs, uh, or when these songs came together. So have these songs changed in meaning and interpretation for you yourself? over the last couple of years. They have, yeah. I mean, for example, the song Remind Me to Forget. Um, that was written in November last year. And up until the pandemic happened, the big cities have always been these like relentless energy, fast pace. You know, your mind is like oh, so much noise, so much action. You know, and there's line in that there's lines in that song that refer to, they paint the city like as they were, you know, but now we've now gone through a pandemic where cities have been silenced. Mm. Um, so it, it's interesting that, you know, I'm now singing the songs and kind of thinking about the time before the pandemic. Right. Let's go to kind of when the song started bubbling up then, um, because I, I wanted to mention briefly uh, the Ultimate album, uh, the Ultimate Collection that you released in 2018, because I can imagine, and maybe this is wrong, but was that kind of a, a, a culmination of everything that happened before and now you're starting on this new chapter? That, that's the way I saw it in a way, but it might be totally wrong. I think you can look at it that way, of course. Um, everything's allowed. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think how I would kind of support that interpretation is this is really my first studio album made in England, um, not working with my previous collaborator and long-term mentor, Mike Bat. Sure. Um, the last record was in winter and that was made in Georgia. So it was a very kind of different type of project. It was working with the classical choir from Georgia. I co-produced it. Um, it was a winter album. It had a concept and it was an amazing experience. But to be making a solo studio album as an artist, it's a crazy thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there is, you have to deal with your ego you have to deal with vanity, with putting yourself out there. Sure. And, and then you have to convince your kind of like inner artistic self, like the one that you cannot lie to, that, that it is worth doing it and it is worth putting the time in. So, so every record honestly feels like a new beginning, especially one where, you know, you're the solo artist on it. 
especially the early stages of, of making a record then, are they very grueling for you in a sense, as, as you describe it, where, where it's, you have to put your ego at rest, but still you have to put yourself out there and have what you make be judged by people. I mean, I saw a clip of where you mentioned all the people that work on the record and uh, that contribute. So you have to show them and tell them, uh, I want to eat here and I want this sound here. So, so what is that process like for you, especially in the beginning of this album? It is, it's really difficult. Okay. It's all, and, and I feel like um, uh, it's really never good enough to kind of just do what you've done before. Mm. Um, because, you know, once you've created a record and you've written songs or you've sung songs and you've released them, they exist. And so by their existence, they have wiped out the ability to do something similar you know that's why you know that's why we can't make records that sound like the Beatles because the Beatles did it so like why would anyone want anything but the Beatles if that's the if the that's what they want um and I feel the same about my stuff it's like I've sung songs like Close Sing to Crazy and I'm in a Bicycle so that's done mm. so it's like every time it's back from the big back to the beginning so are those albums and reactions to, to the previous one, like you mentioned within Winter, that it's kind of a reaction to uh, maybe perhaps the way that process went and now, like you say, you're by yourself. It's, it's, it's a different approach. But, and then, but there's still a connection with your, your home country and, and uh, the orchestras. And yeah, so, so what's the yeah, there's always a huge connection. And it's, you know, I, I always kind of think about... Um, like I respect my own past as well as mm. the tradition of our industry. I find it fascinating. You know, I've had moments where I've been on stage and, you know, and, and I, my vibe might not be good. Like I might be feeling a bit more nervous than I should be. And then I sort of realize, yeah, but you know, everyone has gone through this, you know, even the greats that you admire and you just suddenly feel so much respect for everyone that has gone through that path and that tradition of standing on stage, presenting themselves as an artist, presenting their work. Um, so, yeah, and I'm sorry. So your question was about roots, keeping up roots in Georgia? Well, more of a, whether it was a reaction to, to the process of In Winter as well, where, um, well, I, I would say each album is kind of a reaction for a lot of artists to what they have done before, like you mentioned as well. So, so what were there elements like the orchestra that you thought, okay, this album, I'm going to focus on orchestra and I'm going to focus on this side of, of my artistry. Yeah, actually on, in, on um, album number eight, I really wanted to celebrate great musicianship. Mm -hmm. And that was, yes, yeah, so that was a reaction to it in winter, which was predominantly a, a vocal record, a winter record. And it's like, okay, how... You know, I've had the luck of working with some of the best musicians in England mm -hmm. and they're real characters. You know, the, the session players that work in studios, they, unlike, as you know, classical musicians, they come up with the actual detail of the parts themselves. Mm -hmm. And so their stylistic choices and decisions as we record are really important. Um, and it's important that that atmosphere is, is as good and as comfortable for them as possible. Mm. So for that, I also needed a great producer who could captain them, you know, and that's where Leo Abrahams came in. And how do you then communicate with, uh, communicate what you have in your mind and how you want these songs to be? And then like you say, throw it through that, um, I, I don't know how it's called, but throw it, to those musicians and have yeah. them uh, go loose on it. So, so it's, and like you said, you have to let your ego go in those moments. So, so what, what is that like and how did Leo help in, in kind of that process? Well, it's really, really difficult. That's one of the hardest things. And also when the time is ticking, you know, and the record studio costs a lot of money mm. and musicians cost a lot of money as they should. Um, it's very, very challenging. And because, you know, I said this in, in one of the making of videos, we are dealing with invisible material. So how did I do it? So first you do it by talking, communicating, and then you do it by listening to lots of records, mm -hmm. you know, and I played Leo a lot of records. And I was also really, I felt comfortable because 
he expressed that to him, a producer's role is to bring to life what the artist's vision is. You know, so he kind of, he comes from that philosophy. Um, you know, and I, I think that's a good way of being a music producer. Mm. So I played him um, things like Ghia Cancelli, the Georgian composer, classical composer, who has been very inspiring for me. I also played him Ramsey Lewis's um, Mother Nature's Son, which was arranged and produced by Charles Stepney. Mm. Um, I played him a lot of folk songs by Joe Hickerson. And, and so through the listening of records, through lots of dialogue, he also played me you know, a lot of beautiful music, you know, and through that, and then through just working, it starts to, something begins to form. This is maybe a bit vague then, but what were you trying to capture with the, these collection of songs, with this collection of songs? I think I was trying to capture, first of all, I was trying to see what, what songs themselves are capable of. I was trying to see and stretch myself as a lyricist. Mm -hmm. um, Some of the songs are, you know, they have weaved inside them like biographical things that happened to me. But it's like, how do you do that? You know, like the question of how and how much and how obvious to make it. Um, that was a really important question to me. So like, I was trying to capture like, you know, how do we make a really quality record? That was a question I was interested mm -hmm. in with, you know, like I love tradition. So like the classic songwriting, like I really needed that in it. I love great live musicianship. I love an atmosphere being caught of the people, you know, who are playing this record. And, um, and I was also just trying to catch that, um, you know, and then I'm quite a big dreamer and I, I'm sort of, I'm a radical optimist. So I think Leo then went, really big on the orchestrations and I was just amazed when I heard them. Okay. Um, but let's pick out a couple of songs then. If, if there's one in particular that you, you that is uh, maybe closer to you than some of the others, so we can take that one or I can just pick my favorites uh, from there. Well, I can give you one. I mean, I think I'd like to give you two. Sure. And you should, you should give us a few two or like, okay. you know, one, you know. Um, okay. but probably, uh, Remind Me To Forget, which ends okay. the record, and English Manor. Well, English Manor was, was my favorite as well. So let's, oh, let's yeah. pick, pick that one first, because that's, that's when you mentioned the traditional kind of story of our, our songwriting, that's that story, that storytelling, that narrative style writing. So how does a song like that, and I mean, I wrote down a couple of lines, and one is, uh, it's me at 22, he sees, which I really find interesting. So, so how does a song like that kind of come together? Okay, so... Um, Or just the thematic it, elements in it. In when, you, when you ask me how it comes together, that song took a long time to okay. write. And it was a lot of, like, the, probably the most intense lyric writing okay. I've ever done. Because, because, you know, like, a love triangle is something we've all seen in mm -hmm. our lives. Um, and I wanted to put that in um but uh like I also wanted it to be quite fictional and I wanted it to be a story song like the great traditional folk songs yeah. so the only way that could happen and I could really give it the the sort of like my authority on it was if I developed the characters really well mm -hmm. so each character from that song and even though I'm as a voice I'm the protagonist in it they got their biography written out, you know, so what school yeah. they went to, how the husband and wife met, who is the protagonist, um, what is the relationship, like where they live, what the house is like, yeah. what schools they went to, you know, all of that got developed. Um, and then, you know, it had to get written. But this was all after the music was okay. done. So yeah. I worked with Tim Harris. And, you know, I had some like lyrical sketches, like some certain phrases, you know, and Tim had beautiful pieces of music, you know, and we kind of tried to make it all work. And so we had like a verse one. Um, and the very first idea, the very first sketch of the song was that the other woman in the song was actually his mother. Okay. 
So it wasn't a love triangle to begin with. It was his mum. And then Tim, when he heard the lyrics, he jokingly suggested that it should be his wife. And I was like, that's really shocking. You know, I was like, I'm not sure how I feel about that. And he's quite an anarchist, uh, Tim is. And I do remember then I sang it with his suggestion. And it was completely like it electrified the song idea. And I thought, okay, he's onto something here. Mm. And so then I was like, okay, decision made. We're going to go with this. We're going to go with this slightly controversial love triangle story. Um, we finished the music and then I was on my own working on the lyrics. Um, and actually a lot of the words were done in the cottage that I was at in the Cotswolds. I was there on my own for three weeks um, and just writing and writing. And when you are there kind of secluded in your writing, um, I mean, so some of the other songs, they delve into kind of uh, love and loss and, and um, our, our perception, I suppose, of love and what that is uh, at times. Um, so, so why, I don't know if, you, if there's an answer to this, but why was that on your mind those three weeks that you were in the Cosmos? Um, because I think, well, because culturally, it's a huge topic. Sure. Like it seems like it's the most important thing that occupies our minds. Um, you know, and I don't know if it's just me, but I don't think it's just me, you know, and, and um, you know, I'm someone who had a really wonderful relationship with my husband and then we separated, but it was an amicable separation. I feel like we had a successful marriage, even though it didn't end the way they're meant to end, you know? Um, it's not the storybook ending that everybody yeah, exactly. talks about, right? And, and I found that really, what I found difficult was people's reaction to it. Mm. You know, like me and him were like, we have to do this. This is right. You know, we still love each other. We still respect each other. We're going to be friends for lives, but, you know, it's not going to continue as a, you know, as a husband and wife. Um, and then I, it got me thinking about love propaganda. You know, and it was a term that I heard and I read in David Hockney's book. I'm a big fan of David Hockney, the English artist, painter. And I thought, yes, like that is what it is. It's like, I've heard of lots of different types of propaganda, but love propaganda is, is an issue. Right, I've never heard that term. That's actually good, uh, quite good, it's actually. It's really yeah. good, right? Yeah, and, um, and I thought, wow, I've been part of love propaganda. You know, I've sung songs like Close Thing to Crazy and Nine Million Bicycles, and they talk about this sort of, you know, forever beautiful, like undying love. But it's... You know, and that can exist, and I'm glad it does. But also the reality most of the time isn't that. And and I just really believe that songs and records can take it. You know, even in a mainstream and the kind of artist that I am, it's like I believe I can handle, like, real life um, mm. and, and how the reality weaves into record making and songwriting. Um, I think, you know, that's the sort of path that I'm interested in exploring. And it's interesting because what you just uh, mentioned, I, I think is kind of summed up well in a, in a line from the first uh, song on your record, the haze of love when you are near, uh, but aren't you afraid of the state of us when it disappears? Kind of that, that idea of the, we can pretend. And, and I mean, I, I think media has a lot of, I mean, I would say I have a very distorted view of love uh, because of media and because of music. And kind of yeah. the certain the way some artists are are able or in poets to describe love. I've never felt that the way they describe it. So it's a, it's a, it's a it's a very interesting topic. Then, um, especially because you've you've always been very ambitious and and uh, you had your your things with the, the music industry and uh, getting burned out a little bit a couple of years ago. Is there always a, a struggle between kind of presenting that view of the world and pre uh, presenting kind of the, the perfect view of the world and then pretending like nothing's wrong with the world in a way? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I really, I like what you said about um, never really feeling love the way it's presented by poets and mm. um yeah, I'd say I'm definitely the same. And I think most people that I, that I witness around me are the same too. You know, mm -hmm. there is a huge gap between how the media and how kind of 
the culture of love is presented. Um, I mean, I wouldn't attribute that struggle uh, as the only reason why I burnt out. You know, there were lots of, like, there's always like five or six reasons that something happens. Like, I don't believe in like finding the one thing or the one person being like, it's their fault or it's because of this. There's, you know, life is complex. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I do want to be able to be like at least representative of who I am as I grow up, you know, and also not get down about the fact that I get older and mature and I age. Mm. I think that's really important. There is, you know, I f- like that's a, that's a funny thing. The se- the sort of obsession with youth and beauty. Um, when in fact, when I look around me, like the most beautiful woman I know is my mom, mm. you know, and like the older she's gotten, the more beautiful she becomes. And it's like, that's what I see with my eyes. So why, why do I not see that in the media with the women? You know, it seems like there's a psychological kind of, uh, gap between sure. like the beauty in real life, which is actually majestic and you can't better it. And then what beauty becomes in the media and in, and in culture, you know, and in cultural sort of art forms. It's, it's very interesting because, well, obviously I'm not a public person, so nobody has an opinion about it, which is great. But for you, it's, it's a little bit different when it comes to those kind of things. So, so is that something you had to realize gradually or was there something that happened where you kind of find out, where you realized that certain pursuits were worthwhile and certain weren't? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I was like... I was always just obsessed with music and the feeling that music gave me mm. and everything else around it, like being a young woman in the music industry and being told that I was beautiful. I just kind of thought as like, great, but like, whatever, you know, it was, to me, it was just like a side thing. And it's like, let's let, like, let me just work with the music. Like, that's what I'm interested in, you know? And then occasionally if I was, um, asked to do an interview for like a showbiz magazine. I was like, like, whatever, like that doesn't, you know, I'm happy to do interviews. I'm happy to like do what I need to, to get my music heard and out there. But, um, you know, let's just not mess about with like bullshit. That's just not important. Like who cares? Um, you know, and then thankfully, you know, my PR people kind of saw that it was quite a strong, clear direction and they got it. Um, But in terms of people's opinions, yes, sometimes you do get affected by it. But then also, I'm kind of like, again, it's like, it doesn't matter. Just stay focused on the important thing, which is how I feel about the work, you know, and the experience I'm trying to create for the listener. Um, That's a, 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 I like that last thing that you said, the, the experience you want to create for the listener, because especially in the, uh, nowadays with with the pandemic and everything that's going on in the world, uh, people don't hear music or listen to albums the same way. There's no live shows, there's, uh, there's different tools for you available to promote the records. And, and maybe you can talk about kind of the, the album cover and, and the fact that you did some mixing, because now you have to do all these these uh, things yourself as well. So, um, yeah, how do you feel about going into this whole process uh, kind of in, in uncharted territory almost? I actually have been really enjoying it okay. because I think it, I've come to realize that I'm quite um, like an adventure seeker. Mm. And so I'm actually not good doing things that are predictable. Okay. Um, you know, and I kind of find I become sort of bored quite easily if I'm repeating things. Um, so this has been really quite, quite interesting. <laughs> On the mixing side, the record was mixed by uh, Cameron Craig. Okay. But I was, I had to be there to listen to like everything. And it was, vir- you know, so I, we were doing it virtually. So I was listening on my headphones or my, or the speakers mm-hmm. as he was doing it in real time. And then, but the photography, yeah, uh, that was in deep lockdown and we had to get the album cover in once the record was finished. And um, Rosie Matheson sent me her camera. I'd never used a film camera before. And I loved kind of discovering it. It was really cool. I've actually got a camera arriving on Monday because obviously the one I used for the front cover, I had to give back to Rosie. 
because it's hers. And uh, yeah, I kind of got hooked on the idea. Okay, so so for the future, uh, this is something you because I, I read you talked about this in a video, I think, or I read it somewhere. But you mentioned that you kind of now look at light differently and see how how yeah. light falls and that kind of stuff. So, it, has this pandemic uh, also brought along some silver linings in in, in like things yeah. like these where you develop uh, new skills? And Definitely, like you know, to have this kind of interruption and this kind of revolution in your life, I think is really good. Because, yeah, it does sort of, it shows you that life isn't predictable and that anything can change. Um, and particularly in the West, I think we're so accustomed to peacetime, um, you know, and being able to go on holiday and going to buy anything and going to restaurants. And then suddenly, a pan, you know, something like this pandemic happens and everyone is going, oh, wow, you know, life isn't so predictable. You know, no one is... Um, uh, immune to a big life change and and I think it's good for the spirit you know and for how we how we sort of look at ourselves final question then uh, what do you hope uh, once the album is released that people will be able to find in it or take away from it I would love it if people kind of um, just enjoy it you know and just like I mean I get the most unexplainable feeling when I listen to great records mm. you know and if I can share some of that feeling with my records then the job is done <laughs> now <laughs> well one less uh, thought on this then because uh, as, as a songwriter you mentioned kind of continue trying to develop what, what for you is, is your um this is gonna sound weird. What are you trying to get towards as a songwriter, so to say? What What is your um, is, is the pursuit, so to say, a perfect song? Is is that is that kind of what the pursuit of a songwriter is? No, I think the pursuit is transformation. Mm. I think that's the pursuit. I mean, but you know, it's it's like it's not just one thing. Sure. I, I know you said that. Um, you notice that I'm ambitious and of course I am ambitious, but you know, I realize, I mean, it's, a, it's a cliche, like the purpose isn't to get to the end. Um, especially when the process of writing is actually so beautiful, you know, like I have, ex like I've actually experienced writing completely transforming me, you know, and I discover new things about myself and, And, you know, when you just keep going with something that is so difficult and so tough to, to crack and to make great and beautiful, and then over time it gradually happens, you do get transformed. So I think that's the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. Katie, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank Love you. to talk to you.